Welcome back to the Mental Health Toolbox. My name is Patrick Martin, and in this episode, I interview cancer survivor, COVID-19 survivor, Olympic weightlifter, alcohol and drug counselor, and now social work student, Nikki Hernandez. So don't miss it. Let's go. Hey, Nikki, thank you so much for uh, being willing to jump on and allow me to interview you on the Mental Health Toolbox. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, maybe you could uh, start us off by letting the audience kind of know what you're about. What's going on with you? So uh, thank you for having me. It's um, very exciting to be here. Um, so I am, by trade, I'm a substance abuse counselor. I work in the mental health field. Um, I'm also... Uh, a blogger now. I just recently started on that endeavor of um, kind of bringing more awareness, especially to um, empowering women. And um, I, on a personal level, I'm a, a, a mom of four, a grandma of five, um, and I enjoy Olympic weightlifting. So kind of all of it. <laughs> awesome. That's a lot on your plate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm type A, so I have to do everything. <laughs> oh, I understand that. Yeah. So what's, what's been the progression like for you? How did you, did you start off with blogging or did you start off with AOD counseling or what did that look like for you? So I started off with AOD counseling. Um, I'm in recovery myself um, since October, 2008. So I, uh, it's kind of interesting how it happened is I had said that I was never going to be a drug and alcohol counselor because it was this whole thing of that's what everybody in recovery does. Mm -hmm. And um, I went on a panel in Pomona to, uh, it was uh, juveniles. And there was a little boy, he was probably 13, maybe 14. That was just like the, the look in his eyes had me the entire time I was sharing. And right after that, I went and asked the, the worker there, like, how do you get into this? Um, you know, I feel like this is something that I can do to help make a difference in other people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, a, cause I've been there. And then B, I just felt so drawn to doing it. And that next week I went and registered for school and that was just kind of, the rest was history. So um, it was a little bit challenging because I typically, they don't hire people unless you have at least two years sober. And I did not by the time I mm -hmm. completed it. Um, but I, I have been very blessed throughout my entire career of um, where I've worked. And so where I did my internship actually hired me. And um, yeah, so it's been fantastic. Thank God. Wow. So it's kind of like this combination between a turning point for you, but also kind of the stars aligning to make it to kind of pave the way. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, right. absolutely. Absolutely. I really found that to be true in life. Like when you start to act, when you get passionate about something, uh, you start to see opportunities and they oftentimes work in your favor when yes. you're ready. Yes, absolutely. I worked with adults for, um, like the first few years of my, of my, um, probably two to three years. And then I, I ended up at a psychiatric hospital mm -hmm. and there they had an adolescent unit. And it was the first day that I went into group there. I walked out and I told my supervisor, put me there every day. Like, that's where I'm supposed to be. That wow. That's you my niche. That's, felt a calling right there. I just felt it. And, um, you know, I've tried to work with adolescents since then, you know, things change obviously um yeah. you know but yeah that that is definitely definitely my passion and and where i would love to end up um yeah yeah because you never quite know i think early, especially early on in a career you know where it's going to take you I, I remember when i was in graduate school i interned at a probation camp and i thought oh i'm always going to want to work with gang youth that's just a passion yes. and up to that point all my volunteer experience you know in college before college was with youth and teenagers and so I always thought, hey, this is my, this is going to be my, my, my people. And then my first job out of college was with an adult outpatient clinic. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. And yeah. then, you know, over time I learned, oh, well, it's the same problems. It's, they're just older. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Maybe not, you know, sometimes it's nice to have an early intervention, right? Yes. Yeah. But I could imagine, especially with substance use, like the earlier you catch it. Yeah, I found a lot because I, I worked with, um, after the psychiatric hospital, the places I went after that were with um, probation and DTFS and stuff like that. So um, I found with, with, especially with that population, um, you know, it's unfortunate, but those kids obviously 
most of them didn't have the best role models. Um, mm-hmm. And a lot of them felt like, you know, nobody cared. And so this was just how they were destined to be. And so, um, you know, it's a beautiful feeling when, when your clients will tell you like, you know, there's something different about you. I can tell that you care about me, Nikki, and that you're, that you're, you're telling me the truth. You're not just BSing me, you know, like Mm -hmm. everybody else does. And so for me, that was definitely where I, I feel very, very comfortable in that, in that program, because I get to be that person for them. Mm -hmm. Um, However, now I'm working with adults too. So, (laughs) right. Right. So you never know where things go, but yeah, that, that's, that is 100% where I hope to be again. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I definitely know that was my experience in working with you. It's kind of a different dynamic. Yes. You know, it's kind of like sitting alongside of them as opposed to across from them. Right. 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 And, you know, I talk a lot about superpowers, you know, when I think about the helping profession, you know, mm-hmm. it's not a cu- cookie cutter thing, right? No. It's almost like this mix of art and science. <laughs> Right. right. Um, And everybody brings their own kind of superpower to the mix. And so it sounds like maybe for you, that's something you've you've touched on that resonates with the people you serve is your transparency. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm fairly, I I tell people that I'm an open book. Um, You know, I don't, there's a line though, where it's not Mm -hmm. about telling my life story. That's, Mm -hmm. I'm not there for me. I'm there for them, but they, the way that I speak, they understand that I know what I'm talking about because I've been there. You know, I use a lot of I, we, us. There's never the pronouns, a right? Yeah. The, and so the relatability. Yes, yes, yes. Without and then when they ask questions, I'm honest. I'm not going to, I don't, you know, yes, I'm in recovery. Yes, I went through that too. Yes, I understand what this feels like. You know, yes, I had an alcoholic mom. Like, so they, it's, I'm able to utilize my past as like my strength now, you know, so right. my past was not pretty <laughs> no. at all. Um, but it definitely has benefited me today, you know, so it's, it's Excellent. worth it. Right. So in one sense, it gives you merit. And on the other sense, it gives you kind of experience, right? Firsthand experience of, yeah. of triumph over tragedy, right? Yeah. Yeah. So how yeah. have you in, in your work so far, because you're about what, a decade in? Uh, 11 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. So by now, um, obviously this comes probably secondhand to you navigating those boundaries, but what was your experience along the way? How did you learn when to tap the brakes on self-disclosure versus when to, when to use that for the rapport, the therapeutic rapport? Um, you know, I, I've had different, um, supervisors and, um, you know, mentors along the way and, a lot of it was from feedback from them. Um, One of the things early on was uh, because I'm in recovery, you know, I'm 12 steps. So I have a sponsor. Mm -hmm. Uh, My sponsor told me very early on, I think the first day of my internship, this is not your recovery. This is your job. Mm -hmm. And it that's been with me the entire time. It's I'm not there for me. I can utilize my strength to help, but I'm not there for me. And so um, just having my supervisors, my mentors, my sponsors kind of letting me know, like, you know, maybe not doing this, maybe doing this. Um, I like to have people sit in on my groups in order to, you know, I, I, I like feedback. I like to know, like, what can I change? What was good? What, what can I do differently? And that's kind of how I've learned now to navigate it. Um, I feel like I'm fairly skilled at it at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's been so long, but um, yeah, I, I, I like to hear from other people in the field um, that can tell me like, you know, hey, that was really good or, or maybe, maybe cut back on that. So <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So <clears throat> sounds like you've accelerated your, your professional development by being open to feedback, constructive yes. criticism. Yes. Right. I think it's important. Oh yeah. Huge. Um, but just because somebody's in a helping profession doesn't mean that they have a propensity toward being open to feedback. Right. Oftentimes people have um, imposter syndrome and they're afraid that if they ask questions, um, then people will figure out they don't know as much as they thought. There might be judgment, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, and I, I think because of my recovery experience is where I've been able to just like be really receptive to what you tell me and if I don't agree with it I don't agree with it that's okay Mm -hmm. um but I can have a conversation about that like this is why I don't agree um you know let's let's 
I, the communication I think is huge. And I feel like the only way that you're ever going to grow as a human is if you are willing to listen to feedback from others. You know, uh-huh. I don't know everything <laughs> by any means. And so I'm not going to learn unless people tell me. Good. And it sounds like you're also aware that just because somebody has an opinion doesn't mean it applies to you or that it's valid, yeah. right? In, in context. True. Yes, very <laughs> so being true. able to discern too what's, <laughs> what you can use and, and what you can dismiss. Yes, yes. Good. Good. All right. So you've been working as an AOD counselor for 11 years, alcohol and drug counselor, um, but you got into blogging, right? Yes. Recently. <laughs> so you want to talk a little bit about that? How did you make that transition or when did that come up? So, um, okay. I have been wanting to, for probably the last eight years, um, I had decided that I was going to write a book, um, and it was going to be my life story. Um, and it was more kind of like a therapeutic process for me of doing it. Um, but then it was also, you know, people were like, (laughs) when I share any like bits of my story, they're like, dude, are you serious, Nikki? Like, that doesn't happen to people. I'm like, well, it happened. So Mm -hmm. um, my life has been very, very unique, very challenging, very good, you know, very sad. There's trauma, there's recovery. And so I just felt like it would be good to, um, you know, kind of put that out there because it does, my past doesn't have a hold on me anymore. So I'm able to share about it and be Mm -hmm. okay with it. Mm -hmm. And so since I had decided to do the book, um, you know, it kind of sat on the back burner and I had thought like, maybe I should start blogging probably about five years ago, but I was raising kids and Mm -hmm. working full time and school full time. And so it was just, there was never, you know, there was never really any time to do it. And so, um, this year, (sighs) goodness gracious, uh, (laughs) November was probably one of the worst months I won't say of my entire life, but it was pretty challenging. And, um, what happened was I, I, I contracted COVID, um, the day that I tested positive, uh, my dermatologist called and let me know that I also had melanoma. Oh my. And so it was, um, really challenging to kind of process it all a, because I was super sick, like really, really sick. Um, COVID almost got me, um, thank God I have fantastic doctors and, and, you know, the treatment was amazing, but, um, I was really sick. So it was hard to kind of process it all. And then, you know, a friend of mine asked me one day, like, how are you really doing? I know you keep telling everybody like, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'll be fine. But how are you really doing? And I kind of just broke a little bit. And I was like, I'm so overwhelmed with what I'm, what am I doing here? You know, what am Mm -hmm. I don't know what to do with this anymore. And, um, that same day, my therapist was like, you know, why don't you write? I know that you like writing. Why don't you write? Mm -hmm. And so I was like, "Hmm, why not? I don't have anything else to do right now. You know, just being at home sick, I might as well. And so um, my friend Janelle set me up with a a website. We got everything, you know, going in the background and I just wrote. And uh, my first, my first blog was um, being diagnosed with COVID and cancer the same day. And how I processed that and, um, you know, I just went from there and I'm hoping that this will allow a place for, you know, if for everybody, but especially for women to come and feel safe and not alone and, um, understand that like depression, anxiety, recovery, you know, domestic violence, trauma, all these things, you can recover from it and you don't have to do it alone. I think that's kind of like my biggest reason why I got into it is that, Um, you know, oftentimes people with mental health issues or addiction feel very alone Mm -hmm. and like nobody understands and they're the only one. And so I just wanted to use my story and my voice as an outlet to say like, you're not, you're not alone. Um, you know, there's more people than you would think that are going through these same things that you're going through. So that's that's kind of your mission. Like you're trying to destigmatize. Yes. Yes. mental illness or trauma yeah. or substance abuse history and because oftentimes yes. there's a lot of shame and guilt that surrounds that a lot of rejection judgment right 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 from 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 family from society um I think one of the biggest ones though is from yourself mm-hmm. um I know that was the thing that I that I dealt with was you know the the guilt and the shame that you feel within yourself 
Um, and that's the hardest one to forgive, right? We can forgive other people fairly, you know, yeah, we got to go through some process, but learning to forgive yourself, knowing that you created some of that turmoil, it's a hard one to do. So I, I hope that my voice can help others see that, like, you know, it's possible. It's definitely possible. Awesome. So that's your why. That's kind of like the motivation yeah. behind the blog. It's kind of been accumulation of things. Yeah. Yeah. Your passion to write a book, to share your life story, but it's come into season. It sounds yes. like, because yes. oftentimes, like you said, there are other, other missions in life, right? Raising kids and other yes. responsibilities, but also emotional, re- emotional um, recovery, right? Yeah. When we're at a place where we can actually talk about those things without it being maladaptive, right? Right. Doing more right. harm than good, right? To where it's about serving. Yeah. And I think that's the thing is that, you know, I've been, um, I've been in therapy since I was 15 and, mm-hmm. you know, different therapists, different things, you know, or oh, you have depression, you have anxiety, you know, do this, do that. So I've done, you know, that whole routine, but it wasn't until I actually got sober where, um, I did the work on myself and, and now, you know, the therapist I have now, like I'm, I'm able to actually be honest and open and receptive to it now, you know, whereas, I mean, when you're 15, like, you don't, you don't know any better. And, and, you know, at the time I was, I was using, I was drinking, I had just had a child I put up for adoption. Like it was just a really like ugly time in my life. And so Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm going to go sit in your office, but I'm really not going to do therapy because I really don't care right now, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think being able to, to process all of that stuff now, it just makes me, you know, stronger as a, as a person, you know, and then I can share that with others now without feeling so <clears throat> negative or guilty or anything. So. Wow. Excellent. So you're definitely a, have a tenacious person. It sounds like. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but I don't want to drive. I don't want to just drive by the fact that okay, so you checked off raising the kids, like you're in a, you have more time on your hands, but now you just, you get handed this bag of COVID slash cancer, and yeah. at a time where you thought, ooh, I can exhale, I can breathe, I can work on some stuff, right? Oh, but wait, you know, yeah, I'm in a pandemic and I got COVID and I have skin cancer. So now, what do you do with that? How did you, how did you still kind of create this? this blog, this platform, maintain your, you know, what you have going on as a, as a counselor in spite of these things? I think um, for me, writing is very therapeutic. And so it helps me. Um, I write almost daily um, just Mm -hmm. to kind of, it's just, it's very therapeutic for me. It always has been since I was little. And so um, it was kind of like an easy transition. I think the hardest part that I've been dealing with is being like really authentic and honest with what I'm really feeling and going through. Cause there's a lot of fear happening. Sure. Um, and so, you know, being able to write and share those things has helped me deal with my own, you know, anxiety and fear that I have going on. Then I will say, um, you know, I always say like, if, if I help one person, then I feel like, you know, I've been a success. Right. Mm-hmm. And, maybe three weeks ago, a lady messaged me on Instagram and said, you know, Hey, I found your, your blog. Um, and she, she, um, tagged me in the, the post of the COVID and cancer diagnosis. And, uh, she said that she was at home right now with COVID and just got the phone call that she had melanoma. Oh, wow. I was just like, Oh my gosh. Okay. All right. Thank who, you. I see. I understand predict that one. Yeah. yeah, nobody. And so it, we've been able to form this bond and be in communication daily. And, you know, she's getting ready to go into her surgery tomorrow. And so it's just opened that door. And I think that that's what kind of keeps me going and pushes me is when you have mm-hmm. those little things that are actually really big things happen to just show like what you're doing, you're on the right track, like you just got to keep going. Right. Those are reminders that oh, I'm doing I'm not just this isn't just an exercise of utility. This- right. You're not just hiding behind a keyboard, but you're actually engaged too yeah. with your audience, yeah. right? The people you serve. Yeah. 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 So it's kind of a it's 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 very cool. It's a very it's a very good feeling to have to know that you know one one thing I wrote touched somebody else. You know, and it's not right. the first time, but that was obviously kind of like a major one. Like, okay, hello, <clears throat> this is what I mean by you're not alone. Who would have ever right. thought? Not just a concept. 
<laughs> right, right. Right. It's real people, right. real lives that you're touching. Yeah. That's powerful. That's powerful. All right. Excellent. So other than being an AOD counselor <clears throat> and a blogger and soon to be author, <laughs> there, uh, there's another aspect of your, your tenacity, right? Do you want to share yeah. a little bit about that? Um, let's see which one. Uh, I know. <laughs> uh, maybe being an Olympic uh, weightlifter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just that little thing, you know. That, that small thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do. I do um, Olympic weightlifting. Um, you know, I just, I started, I want to say I went to the gym, maybe in 2014. And, um, you know, it was really, it's a struggle because I was very overweight. I was like over 300 pounds at the time. And there's always kind of the stigma around going to the gym when you're overweight, even though mm-hmm. you're going because you're overweight, but you know, some gyms, you know, people look or mock or whatever. And so I got, um, I, I, I landed in a great place and I met some really cool people who kind of helped me on my journey. Um, and so from there, I've always been into, you know, working out. I've always, you know, again, it's another thing that's really therapeutic for me. If I'm like angry or, or sad or whatever it is, especially angry, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know, throwing some weights around really helps with that. Um, but I got into um, CrossFit and, you know, from there, I just, I fell in love with, with the lifts and um, two years ago, it's been about two years ago, I just committed fully to doing the Olympic weightlifting. And so, you know, I train five days a week. Um, I, I love competing. Uh, I'm definitely, I'm never number one. I like, I lift probably the least amount in the weight class, but it's the me competing against myself each mm. time it's I'm always better. And so, um, I, it's something I, I, I love doing and, you know, it takes a lot of dedication. There are some times where I've been really bored. Like I am so tired of doing this five days a week, you know, for the last two years, like it can get kind of repetitive. Um, but then when you make those lists that you couldn't make before, it's just like, ah, okay, there's my power, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily just the physical power because weightlifting is not the physical is there. Yeah. But it's more, it's your, it's your mental. And that's something that I think I fell in love with the most, the community. Um, a lot, a lot of people in the community struggle with, um, mental illness. And so it's our, it's, it's the way to, you know, kind of overcome that and, and, and teach yourself, like your mind is, is an important instrument to utilize, Mm -hmm. not just what we do with work, but when we're in the gym, when you're, you know, Mm -hmm. when you're trying to be positive with yourself. And so, yeah, I, I love it. I think I have a fantastic coach. Um, you know, I, 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 like I said, the community is amazing. So it's, it's, it's a lot of fun for me. It's a lot of fun for me. Absolutely. Sounds like that. (laughs) Sounds multifaceted. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people think like, oh, you're just lifting weights. And I'm like, no, there's so much more to it, you know, especially if you're having a, um, a bad day. Sometimes you just have those off days and you're trying to lift a weight that's like nothing for you. And for whatever reason, you keep missing it. Right. So having Mm -hmm. to go on, okay, let me sit down. Okay. Let me do some breathing. Let me, let me try to focus. Like what's really going on in my head. That's making me not connect with the bar. Right. And so there's a lot of ways uh, an opportunity to um, work through, you know, the mental blockage that you're having. And then to go up and make that lift, it's just like, okay, okay. I got it now. And then you take that into your everyday life, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. A form of self-compassion. <laughs> yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. And you practice what you preach. Right? <clears throat> yes. So in therapy, oftentimes we call sublimation. We're taking these negative pent up contained emotions and we're finding a way to transfer those into something uh, proactive, mm-hmm. something, you know, that creates personal development yes. as opposed to the old idea of punch a pillow. Right. <laughs> Which we never worked for me. <laughs> yeah. And then we're reinforcing the anger, but right. the expression or the exercise, the running, it, it is kind of twofold, right? It builds self, not just um, discipline, but esteem. Yes. Right. Self-esteem, yes. which is kind of the kryptonite of shame. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I'll say that's the, that was a, um, 
you know, I didn't want to compete because in competitions, you have to wear singlets, right? Mm -hmm. And I, my body type is not singlet material in my head. So I thought, right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I would tell my coach, like, no, I'm cool. I'm just going to keep training. I don't really, like, I'm good. I don't want to do this. And he was like, why? (laughs) Why? Why are you, you, like, why? What's the point of training if you're not going to do anything with it? And mm-hmm. so, you know, we had a conversation about it and, um, and he really kind of helped me through that blockage. And it was like, you know, the first time I competed in a singlet, nobody cared, nobody cared, mm-hmm. um, at all. <laughs> nobody <laughs> cared. Um, it was only me. And so it was like, it, it's, it's empowering. Now I try to wear my singlet once a week now, just to kind of be like, look, this is, it is what it is. Like I'm. I'm lifting weights that normal people can't even do, right. you know, and I'm in a singlet and I don't look too bad. So, so why do I have to continue to beat myself up over what I look like in a specific outfit, you know? So it, it definitely, it all just ties together, you know, having to continue to, to build on my self-esteem and self-worth and then being able to share that with, with other people, you know? Yeah. yeah. Consistency. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Right? Yes. <laughs> Pushing through that messy middle and remembering why you're doing what you're doing and all the, right. you know, the things that you might maybe think in the front end, oh, people are going to judge me. Most people don't care. They're not paying attention. <laughs> they're not. They're not. <laughs> it's really, like you said, you're in competition with yourself. Yes. Yeah. Right. Good. Yeah. I, you know, I think that's a great message for the listeners, you know, who get, you know, a big part of anxiety, which piggybacks on substance use and as well as depression is that comparative thinking. Yes. Yes. You know, most, most judgment and shame stems from comparative thinking that reflected appraisal that pe- you are mind reading that we know what people are thinking about us and that it's negative. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. And if something's perceived to be real, it's oftentimes real in its consequences. That's why we back out of our commitments. That's why right. we, we lose motivation, right? right. Is it because we start postulating what we think the world believes about us, which is, is so far skewed and removed from the truth that we psych ourselves out. Yeah. Self-fulfilling prophecy, but you found, you have found a way to push past that. Well, yes. And one thing that I have like little mantras that I, you know, repeat to myself. And one thing that I share probably every single group, but so for my clients never get tired of it because it's like a reminder is that if I compare myself to myself only, I'll never be disappointed. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, if I stop comparing myself to other people and society and everything else, and I compare myself only to myself, I'll never be disappointed because where I was, you know, 10 years ago, where I was five years ago, where I was a month ago compared to where I am now, I'm always growing and evolving and I'm always getting better. Hmm. So if I stop and, and, and just tune out everything else and just take a pause and look, okay, where was I two months ago? How was I feeling? What was I going through? And where am I now? You'll never be disappointed if you compare yourself to yourself only. It's a hard thing to do. It's really not easy, which is why it's a mantra that I must say daily. But you know, it's a true baseline, right? Yeah. (laughs) Right. Everything else is a moving target. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Good. Good. Well, thank you for sharing that because I think that's a huge, you know, part of your journey, right? Mm -hmm. Is you know, outside of what people see in your private life. The, the, dis- the self-discipline, the goals, the bars you're setting for yourself. Yeah. The bars are lifting. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So um, to dive a little bit deeper, it's not just the blog and being a counselor and being a weightlifter. You've kind of very neatly tied that together, right? About your mission, right? And mm-hmm. um what you represent and you've done you've uh what you're promoting right as far as uh some of the the companies you're working with right yes yes yeah Can you share a little bit about that yeah yeah so i um you know i feel like everything combines my whole um i don't know if it's my purpose in life but it's what i feel right now is that mm-hmm. um to be able to empower women and to help them to um you know find beauty within themselves and power within themselves to realize how powerful we actually are, you know, men as well. um, But of course, obviously I'm a woman and and Mm -hmm. my trauma 
what's, you know, what happens with women. And so, um, you know, I utilizing my own story. So it's really about empowering women. And so the companies that I work with, um, that's their, their focus, you know, one in specific is dedicated to, you know, breaking the stigma with mental health and, um, you know, which is a, which is a huge thing. I, I addiction and mental health are the same thing, you know, in, in my mm-hmm. eyes. And so it's all about uh, breaking that stigma. And so <clears throat> I only connect myself to companies that I feel like have the same passion as I have, you know, mm-hmm. I work with the brand girl clothing who it's, they don't even do regular sizes. It's their, their names, right? So you're either, a, you're an Amanda or Heather or Heidi or Sam. So they don't even use sizes. Wow. Just get rid of that, like that, that negative, you know, thing that we have associated with our body image and mm-hmm. what clothes we wear and what size we wear. And so, um, you know, I started working with them and it's been, I love them. I own way too many of their clothes, but but they're super comfortable too, but it's more about kind of what they bring to it. You know, it's, it's not just a clothing brand. It's about, you know, um, finding that strength within as a woman. And yeah. so, um, and then flex and bites, you know, they're, they're very focused on breaking the stigma with mental health. Um, you know, they just d- dropped their new line. That's super exciting. You know, my, I love my shirt. I wear it all the time and, you know, mental health matters. And I think mm-hmm. that that's important for people to see because it's true. Um, if there's one thing that I could, if there's like one thing in the world I could change before I die, it would be that the stigma was gone Mm. when it comes to mental health, the stigma would be gone. You know, um, I think that's probably my biggest frustrations is how, um, bad the stigma is when it comes to mental health and addiction, especially. Yeah. Yeah. So I do whatever I can on my end to help, you know, educate, because I think that's the only way it's going to happen is if people are educated about it. Right. And as you stand up, other people stand up. On, right. You know, right. Mission. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's a powerful why. That's a powerful reason to keep going. Yeah. Absolutely. And the, the self-care, the, what you do with, with your personal life, the weightlifting that, that keeps you from burning out, I assume. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That and therapy. I right? saw so everybody like yeah. every, every good therapist has their own therapist. You know? That's right. <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so you've accomplished a lot. You are consistent. What's next for you? What do you see? I mean, what's, what's next on your journey? Do you think? So, um, I would say like my end game, uh, <laughs> we'll see where it goes. Cause my life just goes where it goes. But, um, you know, I, I, I recently was accepted into college. Um, I'm going to work on my master's in social work. That's fantastic. I always wanted to be, um, what I would really like to do is work in adoptions. That would be my ultimate, um, goal and has been kind of my driving force since I had my own child, um, mm-hmm. and put him up for adoption. I had a social worker, uh, Shirley, I'll never forget her my entire life who was just amazing throughout the entire process um really helped me more than she probably ever knows she helped me um and so that's that's where i that's where i want to go next that's where i would like to be yeah wow full circle yeah 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 (laughs) excellent excellent you know it's not an easy thing to get into and i know that it can be very challenging i know my story was pretty hard but um to have that person there that actually you know cared and did everything they could to make sure that you were okay during the process. That's what I want to be for somebody else. Right. I think it's fantastic too, that you'd be entering the profession of social work with already so much of a knowledge base on life experience and so much to bring to the table. Whereas a lot of people who jump, you know, in, into graduate school have yeah. zero experience in mental health or helping professions. And they have no clue about the lay of the land and what their opportunities right. are. That's, that's, one of my missions of this video podcast is to help educate would be professionals as well as consumers about the ropes on both sides and your options. Because oftentimes like, you know, years and years go by and you don't even know that one, one degree to the left and you can have these opportunities or one degree to the, to the right, you know? Yeah. And the fact that you, because of your experience and your knowledge base, you know, already like, okay, so I've been accepted to an MSW program. This is on my radar, like adoption. So Mm -hmm. you already have, you kind of know what you're gunning for, right? Yeah. Just because, right. It's it's meaningful. Yeah. 
right? which is really, really important with the helping professions that you have these yeah. internal motivations and meaning. So we, because burnout is a real thing. Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> But you've been I, tried I, by fire already, so you know. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I, I've had it a few different times. Yeah, it's a very real thing. Yeah, but I think that's why, um, you know, I've worked at, I've worked in different modalities and with different, um, you know, I've, I've worked with, you know, high end wealthy musicians and actors. I've worked with, you know, kids in DCFS, kids in probation, probation, uh, the psychiatric hospital you know, uh, women only men only I've worked in like almost every modality just to kind of figure out like, okay, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this. Um, I don't think I ever want to go back to this. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So just kind of to figure it out. And I think that that's important for anybody in this field is, um, I, I don't, I don't feel like I'm working when I'm at work. And I think that that's an important thing to have because that's why we get into the helping field anyways. We, we're, we're passionate about what we do. I don't find many people who stay in the field that are not passionate about what they do. And so I feel like if you, if you, if you explore you know, the different modalities and the different you know, communities, then you're gonna really find your niche. And you know, for me, I have a few different ones, but you know, I, I'm, I'm happy pretty much everywhere I go. So, and I, and I truly don't feel like I'm, like I'm working, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm helping people every day and I just happen to get paid for it. So, right. so they say, if you love what you do, it's more of a vacation than a vocation, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. It's really important. And you followed your passions to this point and, I, and you bring yourself to the max wherever you go. And I think that's part yeah. of your magic, right? Yeah. Is that you're, you're real. Yes. There's, there's no. Yeah. Um, Sometimes I'm like, "Mm, maybe I should. (laughs) Yeah. And people know if you ask me a question, I need you to let me know if you want my honest Mm -hmm. truth or not. (laughs) Because sometimes (laughs) you're not going to want to hear, you know, the truth. Especially when we're talking about addiction and recovery. Like you may not want me to tell you that you're in absolute denial right now. And that this is what's going to happen if you don't change it. Right. So. But that's a, that's a core communication skill that we learn as counselors that yeah. a lot of people don't understand is that we're trying to understand what someone needs in the moment. Do they want mm-hmm. advice? Do they want someone to a shoulder to cry on? Do they want someone to just actively right. listen? What do they, what do they need? Do they need practical yeah. advice or do they want something more touchy feely? You know, it's an, everybody's needs are different in how they present yes. different times. And because you're again, in a unique position, you'll make a great therapist because you already know these things. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> right. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, so much we could dive into. I'm curious how, um, where would somebody find you if they want to learn more about you, Nikki and what you're um, doing? So I have my website now, so you could go to that. It's uh, www.vibewithnikki.com. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's probably the, you know, if you want to see any of my pictures, read any of my blogs, you, you will find it all there. Um, I'm also, <clears throat> I'm very active on social media. It's a lot of fun for me. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> so you can find me on, you know, Instagram, Facebook. I recently discovered TikTok. That's, that's been a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> that's been a lot of fun. I'm like, oh, okay, this is kind of cool. Um, yeah, not trying to get paid with any of it, but it's a lot of fun. So yeah, so you can find me there. Um, I My website obviously will kind of link you to any of my mm-hmm. other social media. Or Bookie, if I share that a little bit with the- Yeah, of course. Okay, I'm going to do a screen share. We're going to look at Nikki's website real quick. All right, so this is your site. Can you see it? Yes. All yeah. right, so this is Vibe with Nikki. If you, uh, any of you out there would like to learn more about her and what she's about, her blog, uh, right here um contact i was i was actually perusing your website i love how you just start off with the mission statement here right and little bio and then you have a nice carousel here of your most recent blogs lots of good yeah. family pictures and really personal right nice touch yes. yeah right. family's huge to me yes yeah i think that's make, you make that very apparent and i see what you mean <laughs> at the bottom here are all of your social media links yes yeah excellent so. And I, the website is being updated. Uh, now that my class has ended, I have a little bit more time <laughs> to work on it. So yeah, so I'll be there adding more on there. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Well, very cool. 
Very cool. So if anybody wants to learn more about Nikki and check out her blog, it's vibewithnikki.com. Excellent. Excellent. Um, and I was going to ask, is it okay if I check back in with you, if you want to come back on, yeah. on the podcast down the road, you know, of course. All Absolutely. right. So yeah. yeah, yeah. Move it along. Yeah. Well, super. Well, thank you so much for your time, Nikki. It's super appreciated. Um, I know you've, uh, you're debt, you're, Donating, donating your time to the podcast today is going to touch more lives out there to what you're already doing. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having me. My yeah. pleasure. All yeah. right. Uh, until next time, we'll catch up. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye.